Welcome everyone to this month's Spirituality and Health Research Seminar. Today we have, we are just thrilled to have Jeff Levin give this seminar today. He's going to talk about teaching the history of religious healing. So Jeff is an epidemiologist by training, holds a distinguished chair at Baylor University where he's university professor of epidemiology and population health. He's also professor of medical humanities and director of the program on religion and population health at the Institute for Studies of Religion there at Baylor. He also serves as an adjunct professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences here at Duke. And uh, he is an affiliated member of the Center of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at Baylor College of Medicine. He's a member of the Society of Epidemiologic Research, the International Epidemiological Association, the American College of Epidemiology, and the Society for the Scientific Study of Religion. He's also a fellow at the Gerontology Society of America and International Society for the Science and Religion. He has authored over 230 scholarly publications and he has written or edited 12 books, the most recently being Religion and Medicine, a history of the encounter between humanity's two greatest institutions that is being published, has been published uh, by Oxford University Press. So Jeff has been one of the really, one of the first people uh, in the world who has been involved in religion and health research, publishing um, papers from the mid 1980s onward. And really is one of the key people who has developed this entire field. So that's why we're just thrilled to have him here. And of course, he's been a colleague of mine for you know, 20 or 30 years. So it's just with great thrill that I present to you, Jeff Levin, and so, Jeff, why don't you take it away? Thank you. I think I think I first met you almost 35 years ago. So that's um, 30, 34 years ago. Um, OK, well, what I thank you, Harold. Um, it's really nice. I generally get to Duke a couple times a year. And I've been doing this seminar every year, every other year. Um, and I think originally we were going to do this last summer. But you know, of course, things happen. So um, let me. Uh, share screen to share my PowerPoint here. And uh, let's see if we can get this. Uh, okay, I hope everybody can <coughs> see that. Looks good. Uh, well, so I've, I've uh, given this monthly seminar a few times over the years. And uh, Harold was so kind to invite me to do it again. And I said, Harold, I've run out of research topics. I've done, I've done all my <laughs> done religion and health and altruistic love and Judaism and health, all the different topics I do research on. But, you know, it struck me um, along with research, I'm a professor, I teach. And for the last, oh, several years, I've offered uh, a really interesting undergraduate seminar on the topic of religious healing, the history of religious healing. And I thought that this might make a, a really uh, an interesting presentation. So this is more of a this is less a research topic than a medical education topic, but I think it's fun. And uh, I have this is maybe one of the fa my favorite things that I that I've done since I've been at Baylor, and I think it's a topic that's interesting, um, and it's something that I that I hope could be taught at other institutions. So I'll just uh, share. Uh, my experience teaching this class, I'll talk about some of the conceptual issues involved in teaching religious healing, and I'll share all the details of my syllabus, the topics and assignments and all that sort of stuff. And then just some ideas I have for the future and, and hope to get your guys' feedback. Um, so first off, religion, the religion and healing, the intersection of religion and healing, by, by healing, I mean literally healing. Sometimes we use, in the religion health field, we use kind of these words um, interchangeably. 
religion, faith, spirituality, and healing, healthcare, medicine, so on. I mean, I mean, so by this, I mean literally healing. This is a class on people who are who practice religious healing or spiritual healing or faith healing or energy healing, and um, in some sort of a spiritual context. And, and typically, uh, this content matter, where it has been taught in North American universities for the last 20 years, it's been taught as a, a medical anthropological subject. There are courses, there are books, and so on, on, on healers, on native healers, indigenous healers, or it's taught as, as a history class. There are uh, a couple of, uh, I, know of uh, I know of wonderful medical historians who also uh, study religion, religious healing. The, the first name that comes to mind is Gary Ferndren in Oregon, who's just, just done some fantastic work. Amanda Porterfield, I think at Florida State. So there were some wonderful works of by uh, historians that have looked at the intersection of healing and faith, healing and religion. Uh, and some places, this is considered a religious studies topic, and there may be some coursework or some lectures there as well. And then also, it's a CAM, it's an integrative medicine alternative health topic. Well, Baylor, I teach this within our medical humanities program as an upper level seminar to pre med students or pre health students. And um, so this is geared to providing information for mostly pre med kids that are going to be doctors or are going to go into public health or healthcare administration or, or whatever. And uh, expose them to kind of the, the the, the far side of the intersection of religion and medicine. And I draw on all of this. There's, as you'll see, there's material in my class from anthropology, from history, uh, from religion and theology, and, and, and even stuff that's farther afield than that. Um, so again, the, the way that my seminar differs from how this has been taught elsewhere, it's an elective course in, medical human, in the medical humanities program. Um, it's an upper level seminar and uh, I was just to, to prepare this talk. I was looking through the, the syllabus of the last time I did this course, and there is material. There are articles and book chapters and so forth from a variety of fields. So this is a very interdisciplinary topic. I mean, obviously, there's no textbook of religious healing. There's nothing like that. So I've drawn on material from you can see here: psychiatry, nursing anthropology, ghost psych, and so on, theology, past repair, and uh, bench science, integrative medicine, and, and more fields than that. And so the, the purpose of the course is kind of to introduce these students, mostly pre-med students, to what I phrase it as the multifaceted and long-standing conversation between faith and the practice of healing that dates to antiquity, dates to the origins of, of religion, and dates to the origins of of the healing art. This is this is just a statement from the. So I'll, I don't want to read a slide, but I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and read this. This is the introductory paragraph from my syllabus. This course provides an introduction to the subject of religious healing, including recent research, non-medical healing, and the work of its practitioners are referred to by various names: religious healing, spiritual healing, faith healing, mental healing, energy healing, and each one implies something distinctive. Moreover, there's considerable variation within each category. The healers do not necessarily describe themselves uniformly. To add to the complexity, religious healers are found throughout the world, across cultures and faith traditions, and have existed alongside conventional medical care for thousands of years. The, object, the course objectives, and at Baylor, we're required to list uh, behavioral course objectives in our, in our syllabi. Um, First, just to understand the, the history and scope of this work, just a, a sense of its origins and, and the breadth of what religious healers do. Uh, we talk about some of the theories that have been put forth to, to understand this work. And these theories, these are psychosocial theories. They, they come from psycho cognitive psychology and psychiatry, and they also come from theology and pastoral care and elsewhere. Just try to cover the bases. Um, Baylor is a faith-based institution. Many people know it's historically Baptist school, and we're able to engage faith and spiritual issues a little, little more directly. We don't have to necessarily keep as much distance from them as we would at a secular university. So we have wonderful discussions in class about theology and faith and so on that people don't experience it 
And also, um, another objective is students can share their own experiences of, of, of healing with people they know or themselves. One of the uh, one of the, the course assignments, we'll talk about that later, is students do a compare and contrast. They go off, they visit a healer or a healing service and uh, write up a report and give a presentation to class. Uh, also, you know, what are some of the contemporary perspectives across religions and cultures, what does sociology have to say, in anthropology and psychology and medicine. And then finally, we have some sessions on research. And as Dr. Koenig knows, you know, there's a there's been a lot of research the last 30 years. Of course, thousands and thousands of studies on religion and health, but a subset on healing. There have been some very controversial prayer studies that, that uh, you know, I don't want to be too negative. I mean, some of them I happen to think are very good. I'm probably more positive on that body of research than Harold is, but the, most of it's really bad. And, and I think <laughs> you're smiling. <laughs> and, I, and I think it's important that students be able to be familiar with this work and understand the controversies involved and be able to critique these studies and identify what's good about some of them, what's not good about some of them. And yeah, again, this is not a research course, but I don't think you can teach a class on religious healing or spiritual healing and not engage the last 30 years of however many couple hundred research studies have been on, on, uh, on prayer and healing. It's, a, it's part, part, of, part of the discourse. So the timeline, and this is just, I mean, based on the limitations of doing a, a weekly seminar, the starting point roughly is the healing ministry of Christ. So I look at the last 2000 years. I mean, I wish as you could see, I wish I could cover more, but this is a one semester weekly seminar. So we basically started about 2000 years ago. But over the course, over the course of the course, um, we draw on material and make reference to all kinds of stuff. And again, I went through my syllabus to, to prepare this talk. And over while while probably the largest, um, the largest the, the faith tradition in which there's the most material covered in, in my class is Christianity in various forms from Catholicism, Orthodox Christianity, Evangelicalism, Pentecostalism, New Thought. Um, there's material on Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, a couple sessions on indigenous religions. Uh, there's a, some stuff on Brazilian spiritism. They, they see a video of the infamous John of God. Um, there's a, a whole bunch of stuff on, on the New Thought movement in the 19th century and 20th century. And there's a even some stuff about, for want of a better phrase, the paranormal or sci research and then some contemporary New Age material. So what got left out? Um, really the pre-Christian world. And I, I struggle with ways to try to incorporate this material. It's not because I don't think it's unnecessary, it's very necessary. And in fact, in my recent book that, that Harold mentioned, Religion, Medicine, the entire first chapter is devoted to this subject. But so there's really minimal material on the Greco-Roman world, the ancient Near East, uh, Asia, uh, Old Testament religion, and prehistory. So some mention of it, but you'll see, given the structure of the course and how many sessions we have. I, if I were to incorporate some material here, something would have to fall out. So that, that might happen in the future. So the nuts and bolts, the logistics of the course. First, a little bit, a little commercial for Baylor's Medical Humanities program. <clears throat> this was the very first program in the country. It was the very first undergraduate major in the medical humanities. 2004. The program might be a little older than that, but offered the first major. And this is a field that has grown very rapidly, including including at Duke. <clears throat> um, when I came to Baylor in 2009, <clears throat> excuse me, when I came to Baylor in 2009, I think there were three undergraduate majors in medical humanities in the United States. And one was at Baylor. And then I think, um, and if Dr. Kerwin is here, he might know the answer to this too. I think, I think maybe Benedictine, and maybe Hiram College, I'm not sure. Well, now there's 70 or 80 or 90, I don't know what the number is, but it's a big field and there's textbooks and there's readers and there's professional association and, you know, but, but um, Baylor was the first program. And our number of majors uh, has ranged, you can see here, as high as 250. I don't know what the number is now. We have additional minors. We were at one time, actually, I think, still are the third largest number of majors of any program of any department or program in the College of Arts and Sciences. 
arts and sciences. And the business, we've got tons of business majors and econ majors and stuff. But within arts and sciences, I know biology is ahead of us and maybe one other. Um, what's interesting, possibly unique about our program, I can't say that definitively, is that religion, spirituality, faith is a core focus. And again, that goes back to the historic mission of Thaler and that this is a faith-based school. So along with philosophy and literature and history and all these usual things that are part of medical humanities, and for us, it also includes clinical practicum experiences, bioethics, religion, spirituality is, is on the table. So it's a topic that's broached in some of the other courses. And then we have our own course where there's a class on Christian spiritual aid and healthcare that's been taught all along. I've given some guest lectures there. And so my seminar on religious healing um, fits in with that. So again, this is a this is an elective seminar. Uh, it's considered at Baylor the way we number courses, a quote, special topics. And so there's a bunch of these. And often they're one-off kind of things. A professor will have an idea to teach something and it'll just get offered as MH4 V98 for anybody that cares about that. And um, so mine gets listed that way. Um, I've offered it as a seminar to just to, to eight students, um, honors, pre-med, medical management. They, they, they aren't all honor students, but most of them are. They aren't all pre-med, but most of them are. And they aren't all majors, but most of them are. And kind of by approval from the program, I am. I have a secondary appointment in this program. I'm not actually physically, literally over there all the time or office over there. So I just rely on the director and the director of undergraduate studies to cherry pick the very best students. So they do the they do a, a hard sell, and sometimes I come by and give a guest lecture in one of the classes with the sole purpose of trying to recruit a student. It's almost like recruiting basketball or football players. They call me in and they tell me that one over there, you know, um, that's that's the one we want. And so I'll, I'll give a little presentation in class and hopefully get them to sign up. So we've done this. I This course has been listed, been on the books three times right now. I've also done it in modified form as an independent study. So I haven't offered this a lot. It's not an every year thing. It's like an every other year thing. I just did it. I just did it last spring. Uh, so here's here is the syllabus. So the first session is, a, is an intro to the topic. And I start out with the, the wildest thing I can come up with. There's, there's, there's nothing stranger that in the entire course than the first session. I show them a half hour film of Joie de Deus. I don't know if a lot of you guys know what it is. John of God, who was a, well, I guess I can say now notorious because his legal case has been adjudicated. He was a, 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 a controversial uh, healer in Brazil, a spiritist healer, but even the spiritists, Brazilian spiritists kind of disowned him or kept his distance from him. And he would, I don't know, go into a trance or whatever, work with purportedly entities on the other side, interpret that, you know, don't shoot the messenger, just interpret that how you will. And there's a lot of video evidence of him working with hundreds of people and, and just taking a screwdriver off the shelf and jabbing it up somebody's nose and they don't feel any pain and they don't bleed and then all of a sudden their tumor is gone. So it's just very, very strange stuff. And of course there's been accusations that he, there was a demonic influence involved or accusations that he's, a, he's a, a hoaxer. I don't think that was the case actually. At any rate, very, Google John of God, <laughs> Brazilian spiritist healer. And I, I, I mean, wild wild stuff so my my my, my sense is um, i tell i tell the kids this is the strangest thing you're going to see all semester and so generally if they can if they can get through watching a video of john and god will be good in the history of this course, we had one student drop the course after after the first session because it was too much seeing this seeing this guy at work um but at any rate the, or the thing about john of god Apropos to the, the hashtag Me Too movement, stories came out that he had been doing more than ministering to these people that these pilgrims had come to his clinic for healing. He had been doing some very, very bad stuff sexually, and he was uh, accused of seven or 800 cases of sexual assault, and he will now be spending the rest of his life in Brazilian prison. Um, interesting. At any rate, so that, on that sordid note, that's how that's how the class starts with this this uh, charlatan, I guess. Um, 
But then we move into um, material on hope healing and the ministry of, of uh, Christ, and then three sessions on Christian healing so in, from the medieval time to pilgrimage sites like Lourdes and Fatima and Medjugorje, the material on New Thought, and then a whole session on uh, kind of post-war Pentecostal charismatic Christian healers. Um, we talk about contemporary healers and show some videos of uh, Oral Roberts and Catherine Schumann and even more contemporary figures like Ben Hinn. Um, and, Serena, and you know, it's interesting to me, um, who, like a lot of you, have devoted my life to the interface of medicine or healing and, and religion, is how many of, just in the last few years, students have never, you know, asked, who, who's heard of Oral Roberts? And not every hand goes up, who, or Catherine Schumann. Um, I, I don't know if this is a millennial thing or if it's just my own age, but figures that are so vitally important to the story of 20th century American or North American evangelicalism, charismatic Christianity, Pentecostalism, the students just simply haven't heard of. So it's an opportunity to introduce that topic. Even students who themselves may go to Pentecostal churches or may, may be NBC charismatic. Um, then have a couple sessions on topic of energy healing, People do bioenergetic healing or therapeutic touch or Reiki healing. Um, we, we, see some, we see some visual material. We read a bunch of stuff. Uh, we study the research. Then my favorite session, I call it esoteric and spirit healing. This is for the material that's even too strange for the energy healing session. And this is kind of the new agey stuff, crystals and channeling. Um, we read some material on alien alien abductees who report having come back healed. So it's just really fascinating stuff anthropologically, <clears throat> and it's just it's just interesting. I feel I feel obliged to cover it. And, and by the same token, as I said, if I if I probably if there's a session that has to be jettisoned so I can incorporate stuff on religion and antiquity in the Greco-Roman world, it's probably going to have to be that one. But it's a shame because I really. I really enjoy keeping the material. I enjoy leading that discussion. Then we do a, a couple sessions on modern faith healers. Uh, and then we review the prayer studies, the studies that were done, the Randy Bird study from 1988, for Benson's work. We review some of the writing of Larry Dossey, some of the, the research, the critique, the counter critique, the counter counter critique. So we, we, we talk about all of that. And then the, then the, uh, course ends with three sessions of uh, kind of show and tell students. Uh, we have whole sessions devoted to students reporting on their healing experiences or visiting healing services and then term papers, which are biographical accounts. Um, these are the texts, these are the, the two texts that I've used when I taught this course. Martin Kelsey books a wonderful book. I mean, some of you might know the book. It's kind of a hit, he was a pastoral care person. Um, it's kind of a, a history of healing in all its various forms and manifestations within Christendom over 2,000 years. And the Kinsley book is an a anthropological text, uh, cross-cultural examples of healing and religion. I like it very much. Unfortunately, it is now out of print. And so next time I teach this, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because I, re I really like the book, and I haven't found something to take its place. Um, a little bit of logistics, excuse me, a little bit of logistics on the class. Um, we meet once a week for three hours, not quite three hours, but you know, and I'm, I know it's the same way too. There's classes that meet three times a week for an hour or twice a week for an hour and a half. This is kind of seminar style and it works best, I think, for this topic and for my schedule. So we get together. For some reason, I've managed to teach this on a Wednesday every time, Wednesday afternoon for about three hours. Um, I teach it, even though it's an undergraduate seminar, I teach it as if it were a graduate seminar. So we're all sitting around the table um, and students journal club style present on a respective article. We all read everything, but then students will lead discussion. And so the way that the class works, uh, we start out the first part of it, uh, the, the chapters in the book assignment, uh, any discussion there. So I lead the discussion and sometimes I'll show a YouTube clip or some whiteboard material or bring a little show and tell and we'll have Q and A, and then we'll go into the uh, to the, the meat of the of, of each class. So we're generally assigned four or five articles. A respective student will 
will then lead the discussion, will kind of download that article, talk about the main points, and they need to be prepared with some key questions. Uh, and then we'll get a discussion going. This will go for about 25 minutes. And we'll do the next one, we take a break, and then we then we do the next two. And then at the end, we wrap up, we have some open discussion, and then we make the next session's assignment. And because there's eight kids in the class, and about four articles each time the students present, every other class session, a student is a student's up. So so um, every other class session, they'll be leading, they'll be leading the discussion, leading the presentation on a particular article. And this always this always goes well. Some topics provoke more discussion than others. Some, like some of the, the weirder topics we discover, we, we discuss, we do a bunch of head scratching and I have to I have to jump in. But it usually goes very nicely. Um, the assignments, written and oral presentation assignments, there is uh, there's a written book report, and we'll talk about that in a moment. I give them a list of about 30 books and they on, on healers or healing or fake healing or energy healing or whatever. And they write like a little I don't remember four or five page book report and turn that in. Uh, there's then a report on visiting healers or healing services, and that's a written report as well. But we have a session toward the end of the end of the semester in which all the students present on their experiences, usually with PowerPoint, and it's a lot of fun. And I have I have a slide on that all here. But the idea is I want the, the two people or service they visit to be different, to be somewhat different. Meaning, um, if you go to, you know, some students go to a Wednesday night prayer service at such and such church, or they go to a, a new age healer, or they, get, or, they, or they go to a faith healer, or they go to get some Reiki healing, or they, or, or, or they visit a, a, a Pentecostal church service or whatever, or they go to their own church, which Fits into one of the, which perhaps is a, P, a PC church. Um, the idea is do two things that are different. So don't go to the Wednesday night prayer, at, you know, first assemblies and Wednesday night prayer at second assemblies. I mean, that doesn't count. Or don't go to somebody that, that does uh, work as bioenergetic healing and somebody that does some other type of bioenergetic healing. I mean, do mix it up. And that's never been a problem. I think the students understand that. But the idea is to get a little compare and contrast going. We have a session also. I taught this course in the spring mostly. Um, usually the week, the week of spring break. So there's a there's a two there's a two week break between classes. We do a film session, and uh, this is a lot of fun. I've assigned some film, and in in groups of two, they everybody watches all the movies. But then right after spring break, the students come back, and instead of presenting on articles, they present on these films and. The last time I taught this, we did Elmer Gantry, the uh, Academy Award winning film with Burt Lancaster and Shirley Jones, uh, supposedly modeled after Billy Sunday and Amy Semple McPherson. I'm not sure if that's entirely true. Uh, Resurrection, which was a wonderful movie with Ellen Burstyn, who was um, I think a housewife who discovered she had a healing gift and everything that, that transpired from there. Marjo, which I don't know if anybody, has, everybody's seen Marjo, one of the most celebrated documentaries probably in American film history, won the, won the Oscar for best documentary about Marjo Gordner, who was a child evangelist faith healer who then became a teenager in the 60s and got into all the things that teenagers in the 60s got into. And for him included losing his faith and um, the, the documentary is an expose of his essentially transitioning from a child faith healer to a teenage 20 something con man. I don't know how else to put it. So it's, it's really a fascinating movie. And then Kumar Ray. And I don't know if any of you have seen <coughs> Kumar Ray. This is, this is the movie here. It's an incredible <coughs> film. It's also a documentary. Of a faith healer, except he's not a real faith healer. He was a he was a filmmaker who pretended to be a faith healer, and so it was kind of a con artist. And um, it's a fascinating documentary. The students loved it. The students loved it. They didn't know what to make of it. It's a um, it's a very funny documentary. It's also very disturbing because uh, I mean I don't want to blow I don't want to blow it for anybody who hasn't seen it, but it's. it's what this what this gentleman did was highly unethical, and so we end up having a discussion about 
the ethics of posing as a faith healer and not actually being a faith healer. And then filming a documentary and having people be on film receiving healing from them. It's, kind of, it's, it's very, very strange movies. But at any rate, we have this session where we, where we do film. And then finally, um, and, and they get graded on their presentation. And then finally, the bulk of the grade is a term paper, which is a biography of a noted 20th century healer. And they do, we have a couple sessions at the end of the semester. They make their presentations there and they do PowerPoint. And I say, do it as if you're at a professional meeting and you're getting up and you're making a presentation. And that's a lot of fun. <clears throat> this is, and, and I'll show you, I'll have slides on all, all the topics that the students choose. This is kind of how grades break up. So everything adds up to 100. So, you know, the, the students are, make about five presentations on assigned readings. So and there's the points they get there. The group discussion, we have 15 class sessions. So basically I tell them, say something. If you say something, you get a point. If you sit and don't say anything all class, you get none. I said, everybody should get 50, everybody should get all 15 points. But invariably, you know, there's students that even in, a, even in a small group of eight people around the table, there's always some students that just clam up and don't talk for a session or two. And it's too bad because, you know, everybody should get all 15 points. Uh, then their book review and their healing experiences and then, and then their term paper. <clears throat> Over the course of the, the entire syllabus, this is a selection of some of where some of the, the articles come from. And you see there's, you know, mainstream, even though this is an unusual course, religious healing, they read material from pretty mainstream medical journals like BMJ and Annals and Southern Medical and, and um, you know, American Journal of Psychiatry, American Heart, and, and then stuff outside of medicine as well, American Journal of Social, Medical Anthro Quarterly, but also Flying Saucer Review. So, um, you know, it's fun. It's a, it's a fun class. And, and again, my, my approach is to cover full scope of material, but I want to make sure that, that it's primarily, again, this is primarily a pre-med kind of a class. So we cover all of these topics. We, we read a lot of material from alternative medicine journals, from uh, anthropology, you know, anthropology material, even Flying Saucer Review and, and New Age magazines and things like that. And we see interesting YouTube clips. But, but primarily, this is geared to what can they, as future doctors or public health scientists or whatever, take from this topic and, and apply. The term paper bios. These are uh, some of the folks that the bios have been done on. And I mean, I think this gives a perspective on how fun this course is, how, how fascinating it is. Um, and Nino Fidencio, was a noted figure in, in the curanderismo, the Mexican-American uh, curanderismo. Padre Pio was the, um, uh, now is, is uh, Saint Padre Pio, uh, a gentleman who uh, maybe some of you heard of had stigmata and um, was canonized by the Roman Catholic Church. Satya Sai Baba was a um, Indian mystic humanitarian, healer, guru, and uh, unfortunately, before his passing, it came out, it was possibly pedophile, but you know, not to slander him, but very controversial figure. Uh, Benny Hinn, we all know Benny Hinn is a uh, uh, televangelist and faith healer. Peter Popoff, also televangelist and faith healer, but uh, a grifter, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> he's, been, he's been exposed. Uh, Amy Semple McPherson, sister Amy, the founder of the or preeminent figure in the Four Scroll Gospel Church, Marshall Gortner, who I mentioned, Agnes Sanford, uh, Episcopal, um, Episcopal religious, her husband was Episcopal priest. She wrote a lot about healing, very influential figure, Mary Baker Eddy, the Worrells, who were um, United Methodists, but, but I think were involved in religious science. And, and Olga was a, a very renowned 20th century healer, and Mateo Rasui, the founder of Reiki. So this is, I think this gives a perspective on uh, how varied the course content is. This is what these, these um, mostly Christian, mostly evangelical or Roman Catholic Baylor undergraduate students found to do their term papers on. So this is really fun. And the presentations were uh, uniformly great. Um, and I just, for me, I just enjoy kind of being in the audience, seeing, seeing this material presented. Uh, the hearing experiences, 
the compare and contrast. So this is this is a selection of some of the some of the stuff students have done. Um, and you can see, you know, going to charismatic services and then and then uh, going to a receiving healing from a Reiki healer or going to a unity church service in which there was chronic healing uh, and then visiting a Corandero. Uh, so you get the idea. Uh, it, one student went to an acupuncturist trained by any well. An important thing, this is not a course in alternative medicine, not in any way. This is a course on, on healing, on religious-based or faith-based healing. But uh, I, so an acupuncturist or a massage therapist or a cranial facial therapist, that's fair game if the particular person couches what they do in terms of spirituality or energy healing or something like that. But this isn't, this is, you know, they can't just go to a, you know, an osteopath and have that count for this class. But so here's some of the, some of the stuff. Uh, 2015 when I taught this, uh, one of the students is now a doctor. He and his wife are both doctors. They did, they did their, they did this together. They were dating each other at the time. They went to a, a, a Christian acupuncturist, I think, in Dallas. And it was really interesting. It actually had a, they had a session. And then they went to a, a new age center in Arlington, Texas, and sat in on a crystal healing class. And they said, they said, um, I wasn't there, obviously. They thought the person was a, um, was not on the up and up. Something wasn't right. And so I just I asked them to explain why. And we ended up having a whole conversation in class about uh, authentic crystal healers versus inauthentic crystal healers, which was, which was fascinating. I mean, in a way, it was almost a, beyond my pay grade. But this, again, an example of some of the type of conversation that we've gotten going in class. So this 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 is a fun fun part of the course. This is a list of the books, a sample of the list of books I give them that they select for their book review. So you can see there's stuff all over the map. There's stuff on on uh, Christian uh, Christian uh, healers and New Thought healers and books on research, uh, Larry Dossey books and biographies of uh, energy healers and so on. And um, I wish we had a session where they could present their book reviews. But again, there's only there's only so many sessions that we have. So, oh, um, yeah, student feedback. Uh, when I've done this class, generally, uh, you know, we got for those of you who are academic, it's kind of universal that faculty are evaluated on a five point scale. So, mostly five, sometimes on some aspects of the course, there's a, there's a four, like uh, Dr. Levin assigns too much reading. Okay, so I, I get a four on that. But um, pretty much been very favorably. Uh, received uh, a lot of students say this is was their favorite class at Baylor, which I think is really neat. I, I like that. I like hearing that. Um, um, I've had students regularly ask me for you know recommendation letters for medical school or graduate school. I just, in fact, I just had two um, recently. Or if they take this course as a junior, they or as a sophomore, they ask me to be and in the honors college asked me to be the advisor for their honors thesis. So. And then I've had you know alumni that are that are now doctors that report back uh, that you know this was their favorite class. So so I have to tell you that as a you know as a uh, here at Baylor I have a chair. I'm a distinguished level professor, and so and I maybe it's the same way at Duke. You know I I am enabled to be in the classroom. I can kind of pick my spots, and I'm mainly here to do scholarly work and to write and do research and so on. And um, probably most other people at Baylor that are in the distinguished professor or university professor aren't in the classroom as much. And I and I can be in the same boat, but I really love this. I love doing this. In fact, my wife Lee, also an epidemiologist, by the way, uh, also a professor, um, she, she would affirm this, that whenever I talk about this, that she says, my face lights up. Uh, this is probably my favorite thing that, that I've done at Baylor. I've been, I, this fall will start my 13th year at Baylor, I've been here 12 years. And I'd say maybe the favorite thing that I do is to teach a seminar or to give guest lectures. I, sometimes I give lect, guest lectures in other classes. But to have this, the student interaction, to be able to teach students, especially these pre-med kids, and expose them to spirituality in this way, or to uh, have, I have honor students as well. I, I have currently five thesis students, if you can believe that. We just, two of them just defended. Um, but I love this. 
And so this is just, I mean, I don't know how many people watching this are academics or how many are professors or distinguished professors or whatever, but um, I think so this this is this is a, a, just my uh, my unasked for opinion here. You know, as professors kind of ascend the ranks in academia, you know, you buy out of your time, you can you less and less in the classroom, less and less connected with students and more and more about your own work. I I, I have strongly mixed feelings about that. Um, I, I think it's a wonderful thing to get to interact with students. And especially if you're a researcher and you're interested in fascinating topics, what better thing than to try to uh, try to work with students, expose them to this material and have an effect on their life. So I just, even though I am at the top of the food chain here at Baylor, uh, I love this. And um, I, if my time permitted it, I would be in the classroom even more. I think it's just, I think it's just so much fun. And if you can imagine teaching a course in religious healing, I mean, what, I mean, it's fun. I don't know if, if, if we're supposed to say that the work we do as professors is fun, but this is actually fun for me. So for the future, topics I'm thinking about adding. Again, as I noted before, I would love to include more medieval material, pre-Christian, Eastern content, but something would have to go because I only have so many sessions. You know, we have 15 class. This is a weekly, weekly course. There's only so many sessions. My guess is the new AG stuff, line saucer review, all that, that probably would be the one that would get jettisoned, even though I really, I really enjoy, enjoy that. But I think probably to be more comprehensive and more accurate, it would just to have a uh, have a class session on the Greco-Roman world and the Old Testament and, and India and China. Probably need to do that. Um, there's a wonderful video series, a DVD series called Pilgrimages of Europe. And, and if I were in front of a group of people, I'd ask, raise hands, anybody that's familiar with that series. There, a, a lot of these are on YouTube. And these are these little, these are like half hour travelogue documentaries of uh, Lourdes and Fatima and Medjugorje and a bunch of other Christian sites in Europe. I think there's 12, there's like six DVDs with two apiece. So there's 12 of these. It's wonderful. And I, 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 I've been struggling for five or six years to figure out a way to like assign these or have a student pick one of them and present them. Because to talk about religious healing and, and have half of one class session devoted to talking about a couple articles about Lourdes and Fatima isn't enough. This is such a, a profoundly important and central facet of the topic of religious healing. And I just love these, uh, I love these videos. So I might, I might find a way to, to work that in. Uh, I would love to have some demonstrations. I would love to bring people in and have healing demonstrations. Um, I don't even know what that means at this point. Uh, again, with, 12, with 15 class sessions, that might be hard to work in. And they're also, they may be an issue for Baylor. And I don't know, I haven't explored this. I mean, until, until the late 90s, dancing was still not allowed on campus. And so things have, things have opened up a little bit, but I don't, I wouldn't want to do something that would make the administration nervous. So we failed off on that. Although the students do go and have their own experiences. They go to healers, they get Reiki healing, they get cranial sacral work, they go to an acupuncturist or whatever, and that's fine. I would like to at some point, once I've maybe taught this another time and have some more data, I can write this up for a medical education journal. I think it would be fun. And I've, I've begun, I've, I've drafted a syllabus to do another course, something specifically on actually healing modalities, uh, energy healers, or spiritual healers, maybe including body work. I don't know. And I don't know when in the world I'm going to teach this, but I'm doing, uh, Harold mentioned the book that I did for Oxford Press last year on religion and medicine. I have a contract to do a second book for Oxford on um, energy healers. And actually, all these books you see on the floor behind me, these are my, on my to read list to prepare for that. And the, the manuscript was due this fall because of COVID and a bunch of stuff. I pushed it back to, to uh, next March. So maybe by the fall of next year, the Energy Dealers book will be out. And if it is, that, then maybe I'll develop a course and can use the book as a, as a text. But I, I would love to develop something that is a little deeper dig here. And then I could have two courses to kind of flip flop. So that is a, that's the end of the presentation. And um, here I will I will unshare I will unshare the slide. And um, you know, 
happy to answer any questions or um, any feedback. Again, the thing the thing I want to say, even though I'm you know my identity, especially the Herald, my friends at Duke, you know, I'm this I'm this uh, a biomedical scientist, I'm this left brain researcher. Um, I've, I've had so much fun teaching this course. I wish I would have started it, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and I'm somebody that in my prior life before Baylor, I taught medical school in Virginia. So I was somebody that would put on a suit and a tie and have slides and get up in front of 100 students and give lectures on epidemiology and biostats and that kind of stuff. And so now in my in my old age, my 60s, I get to teach about uh, spiritual healers at Baylor. It's, it's just so much fun. And it, it's my hope that this topic can be taught elsewhere. Um, it, it's, I, I think it's so valuable for students, especially their pre-health students or pre-med students, to be exposed to things that their clientele or their patients might themselves be involved in. And I think it's, in my opinion, and so this is my own opinion here, uh, maybe a little biased, and, and this, this holds true, I think, for alternative medicine as well, or integrated, whatever it's called these days, integrated healing. I think it's really important that one's physician, one's primary care doctor, psychiatrist, a pediatrician, or whomever is well aware of what their clientele is doing in a health-related way. And I think when people withhold that information or when there's this information is not inquired about, I think it doesn't help. I think, I think in order to be a practitioner or to be a medical care practitioner, you really need to know what's going on, what, what you're what your patients are doing and i don't know i'm not a, i'm not a i'm not a physician i'm not a clinician i don't know what one would do with the information i mean i know i a herald i, I see dr Curley here so i as far as well i mean if you knew that your patients were going to energy healers or, or or whatever i mean i don't know what what would change but i i would think that as a physician you would want to know whatever what health directed things your people were doing and if there were things that would potentially conflict with what you were trying to do to help them. Uh, so I will, I will, uh, I'll stop now and uh, if there's any questions, if, if uh, Harold has anything, you know. Jeff, thank, Jeff Levin, thank you so much for a tremendous presentation. Uh, we do have a question, Far Curlin has raised his hand. Uh -huh. Far, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, terrific presentation. It sounds like a super fascinating course. I'm, I'm curious, um, and you've, you've, I know, thought about this long and hard in the past, but about how much you dig into the question of kind of epistemology. And, you know, you can, one way to study healing is to look at all the things that people call healing and try to understand them scientifically, some kind of naturalist framework. Another is to sort of try to look at how in different frameworks these actions are understood, leaving kind of ambiguous whether you're taking a naturalistic standpoint or not. So I'm just curious how you handle that. And a corollary that's a little more narrow is, do you look at in detail the, the, the Catholic Church's process of seeking to verify miraculous hearings? Because that seems to me an interesting place for these two things come together. Great, great questions. And I can answer I can answer, but I'll answer the second one first. One of the sessions, so the session we do, and I don't remember where it is in the syllabus, we talk about pilgrimage, we read some articles about Lourdes and Fatima and Medjugorje, et cetera. And we read a couple of pieces on the, and I think Esther Sternberg might've been one of the co-authors, the, the commission, uh, I forget, I forget what it's called. There's a, there's a commission or a medical commission at Lourdes that is set up to evaluate the legitimacy of the healings that occur at Lourdes. And so we actually read two articles on the topic. We get a student presentation on it. And I, and, and I think we watch, we watch like a YouTube clip. Um, and it's really fascinating. And if I recall, again, it's been a year since the last time I, I read the article and taught the course. Um, the first century, I don't remember how many, you know, millions of people claim healings. And I think there ended up being like 60 or 90 total that they that they decided were quote miraculous in the last 30 years um the none or one or something like that so um yes so we engage the topic we read our and i i wish i i would if i remember i'll 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 send you the pdf but there was actually a medical journal article that talked about um talked about that i guess it's commission it's commission within the curious 
uh, the, the first question about um, different approaches to understanding Ontario. What, 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 the very first session when we watched this half hour video clip about John of God, Draw de Deus from Brazil. Um, one of the things that I, I go up to the whiteboard and I say, okay, so the people that were healed, apparently healed, that he, he did their ministrations to and their tumors went away or their bones were healed, what's going on? And we just start writing all the different possibilities. So one possibility, um, God healed them, or what? You know, he he really happened what appeared to happen, and this was a miraculous supernatural healing through Jesus or God or whatever. Okay, that's possible. Um, another possibility, some sort of psychosomatic thing that was of, of you know mind mind over matter. Uh, third thing, maybe he really was connecting with spirit doctors on the other side, and they did something involving and you know another possibility um something demonic <laughs> happened and you know uh, another possibility maybe they weren't really sick and they had a they and um I, I i don't know we just go through we go through all the possibilities from naturalistic to supernatural to this guy's a con artist to something really amazing involving uh, uh transmission of subtle energy is going on whatever and we cover all of it and over the course of the semester we kind of go back to this issue um, uh, when we study indigenous healers in Latin America and Africa, and when we study Pentecostal healing in the United States and so on, we look at people that, that receive healings after going to Chimayo uh, outside of Santa Fe by taking some of the, the, the dirt in the sanctuary and rubbing it on the side. What's happening? And as far as I'm concerned, all, all possible answers are on the table. And different students will gravitate to different types of understandings of this because uh, not you know some students are religious some students are skeptical or secular some are all points in between and of course it's not the, the answer to this question varies by the situation so i do my best um to try to entertain naturalistic explanations for this since i am a medical scientist but to be open to other things as well, and to try to create an atmosphere in, in which all of the students are able to engage any way of understanding this that they think makes sense. And sometimes the answer is, who knows? I mean, sometimes we've seen some very anomalous stuff. What about the people that claim they've been beamed aboard spaceships and been probed by aliens and they, they come back and something's been healed in them? I don't have, I, I don't have a clue. I mean, maybe here, Harold's a psychiatrist. Maybe he has. I mean, I, I don't know. But I think I think in this class, I don't know is an acceptable answer as well. So that's that's part of I think what makes it a fun class. Great. Uh, Rick Bauer is next, and then Tim Holmes. All right. Um, yeah, great. Thank you so much um, for this excellent presentation. Um, what I didn't hear you talk about is that many of these future doctors, um, if they're engaging, especially in the US healthcare system, will be working with professional board certified chaplains. Um, and so I didn't hear you mention the Journal of Healthcare Chaplaincy um, or discussing how contemporary healthcare chaplains you know, like Rhonda Cooper, you know, dealing with this on you know, the amen protocol, hoping for a miracle. Or in palliative care, we often talk about the difference between cure and healing. You know, cure just being presence, absence, pathology, healing more holistic. Do you discuss contemporary professional healthcare chaplaincy in this course? Yes, we sure do. Now we don't have a we don't have a, a formal session set aside for this, but in aside from the readings, talk a lot. I talk a lot in various places in the course about the issues of referral and about the healthcare team, healthcare chaplaincy. I think in the past, uh, I've shared some material of, uh, from George Bichette. Uh, I've shared some material from the Journal of Pastoral Care, Journal of Religion and Health. This happened to have not had anything from Journal of Healthcare Chaplaincy, which I'm sure, believe it or not, I actually I actually published in the very first issue of that journal when I was a graduate student in, at UT Medical Branch decades ago. This it didn't happen to have anything from that journal. But we have had shared material from pastoral care, uh, the various pastoral care journals. Um, also, another topic that we do discuss, it's not, it wasn't in the syllabus because it wasn't the title of the session, but we talk about 
we talk about this in the context of, of missions as well. Most of these kids being Baylor have done overseas work and they've done ongoing, they've done, uh, you know, short term mission helicoptering and they've also done more longer term stuff. And they dealt with they dealt with people cross culturally. And we've talked about not just the pastoral care profession, but dealing with people who are dealing with people who have emic knowledge of, a per, of, of the spiritual life of their clientele and how to interact with them and how to draw on them and how to reach people. So again, topics are touched on, not, not as deeply as I would want to, but they are not, they're not absent from the, from the class. Okay, um, Tim, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so when you, when you talk about healing, that's a pretty broad topic, I suppose, in terms of what is it that's being healed? Um, so I, I would imagine, I'm not sure, but a lot of it is probably people with uh, cancer or maybe uh, behavioral mental health issues, depression and that sort of thing. Um, I happen to be by profession an occupational therapist. So I work a lot with people who've had strokes and brain injuries and you know the like and i'm kind of wondering what does your course go into uh, uh what types of diseases injuries and that sort of thing that is being uh, healed um yes in two contexts for the much of the class early on when we're when we're reading studies of uh, in, indigenous healers in the developing world we're reading about experiences of healing with conditions that are nosologically distinct from things that we have in, in Western biomedicine. So um, uh, spirit loss and uh, things like that. Um, in the context of Western medicine, there are some sessions toward the end of the class in which we go into great depth on these prayer studies on, on these empirical research studies, RCTs, that have been published over the last 30 years on prayer. And we talk about that literature and across that literature and across the related literature on spontaneous remissions, and there's actually a, a scholarly literature on that as well, we talk about the um, different types of disease entities and conditions for which there's healing. We don't necessarily go into depth on the biological mechanisms of healing, but we talk about the research literature. And indeed, there is a, just a spontaneous remission literature, which is a fascinating subtopic here, because it's a question of whether that's even a result of healing or just kind of doing nothing. Uh, there was a book published, oh, I think in the late 90s by the Institute of Neurotic Sciences that had 1,385 published case studies, the case reports in the medical literature on spontaneous remissions or healing of uh, every cancer site under the sun, every major uh, type of chronic disease, acute infectious disease, parasitic conditions. So we, we provide kind of a, an overview of that literature. And then I try to raise the question again, you know, what do you, what do you think is going on here? How, how is healing occurring? And um, again, I wish we could, if, if, if I had more time, you know, we could have a whole session on healing cancer, healing heart disease or healing diabetes. But um, what's fascinating, again, in looking at some of the cross-cultural material, there are ministries, for example, in the developing world in which there are reports of uh, people being raised from the dead. And um, I can't, I'm, I'm not in any position to judge this one way or the other, but, but revivals with tens of thousands of people present and corpus being brought in and people prayed over in Jesus' name and then the person revived. I, again, I'm not... I, I don't want to respond to that skeptically, but I don't want, I, I just don't know. Um, in my opinion, I'm, I'm a religious believer. I'm, I'm a conservative Jew. I, we, we, at, at our services on Saturday morning, we pray for healing. Uh, so I believe these things are possible. Uh, that's not to say I believe that every report of someone being raised from the dead in, in a revival in, uh, in Nigeria means that this really happened. But I think there's, all kinds of, there's all kinds of stuff that goes on. The other thing I just want to say about healing, the first session of the class, the first session of the class, we kind of get into a what is healing discussion as well. You know, we have three hours, so we aren't just watching 
the Where's John of God video. We, we, have a, we have a lengthy discussion. And they read a couple articles, two or three articles, kind of deconstructing this concept of healing. You know, healing has become something of a buzzword. And unfortunately, you know, it's used kind of interchangeably with medicine, health, healthcare. And really, um, if, if I've looked at it, there seems to be three contexts to the word healing. And I, I published an article a couple of years ago in one of the medical journals, what is healing? And I, and I kind of unpacked all of this. Um, first, healing is used as a synonym. Healing is a kind of intervention. So you go to people who practice healing, which is another way of saying they lay on hands or they pray or they send Reiki energy or whatever. So that's healing. So healing is an intervention. Okay. In other contexts, in a medical context, healing is the outcome. <laughs> you get healed. It's like healing or curing or, and, and, and those two terms mean, don't necessarily mean the same thing, but it's the outcome. As a result of whatever goes on, going to have surgery, you hope to experience healing. So it's an outcome. So in some cases, intervention, some is an outcome. And then I'm, as a biomedical scientist, Healing is kind of also used as synonymous with the healing process. So the, the word is sometimes used as salutogenesis. So there's pathogenesis, there's the pathogenic process, and then there's the salutogenic process. <clears throat> if I were king, I would only use it in that last kind. I mean, healing means the, the process of being healed or, or recovering or, 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 or path, pathogenesis re reversing. And in biomedicine, Healing is generally reserved for that usage. And so, for example, in wound healing, we talk about healing, for any of your doctors, primary intention, secondary intention, you know, granulation, all, all of that. Um, unfortunately, in the literature on healing, it's used in all those contexts. And then what complicates it further, in the literature on the interface of religion or faith or spirituality, we have the phrase spiritual healing. And sometimes spiritual healing is used as a seeking a spiritual intervention from a quote a healer or a doctor or a pastor or a chaplain or a prayer service in order to have healing. So that's spiritual healing. But also spiritual healing is used in the context of healing of instead of while well, there's physical healing and mental and emotional healing, there's also spiritual healing. There's healing, healing dealing with spiritual issues. So the word healing has kind of grown to and 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 you know there's cosmic healing and there's there's social healing and there's economic healing and so it's grown that way. So this is the word all by itself. All by itself, the word healing kind of is, means everything to everybody. And I, that's fine. A, a word is whatever people decide it means. But, but as a researcher, I mean, I, that's not very helpful. And if somebody teaching a class, that's not helpful. So really, what I've also in the class are people that are healing as kind of an intervention, doing, doing healing, doing religious healing. So um, that's been the focus rather than so much on, on discerning the mechanisms by which people get cured from certain illnesses, although we cover it. But I mean, just right there, the, the, conceptually, healing is such a strange topic because we, we can't even decide on what the word means. Okay, um, Dorothy Scotton, would you ask the last question before we conclude? Wow, I've got a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, well, how would you dif differentiate uh, religious healing with spiritual healing? You know, many years ago, um, I did my dissertation on uh, healing um, uh, preverbal trauma. Uh, people who had uh, dissociative identity disorder. And uh, not many people will speak to me about it. Um, and I didn't really include spirituality in that, but after I finished my um, data collection, all all of the all of the uh, participants said that their healing was a spiritual process, not a psychological process. And along with their healing, uh, they were healed of uh, many, uh, not only emotional issues, but also a lot of physical issues. So I guess, what's the differentiation? Well, I mean, for me, here, here's how I would answer that, that question from the perspective of the class. It maybe it sounds like a cop out. I don't necessarily differentiate. One of the things I try to do is say, the top of this class, you know, people have used these terms, religious healing, spiritual healing, faith healing, 
energy healing, which often is, is a spiritual component, and, and so on. Me mental healing, and sometimes I mean spiritual. Psychic healing, and sometimes I mean spiritual. My, my intention is to just encourage this, is, is to just look at the various ways that this, this terminology is used, the different meanings that it has, and at the same time, just engage. So for me, this course is about healing in the broader spiritual context. And, and we all kind of have a sense of what that is. Whether we call it this or that or the other thing, I'm kind of indifferent. I just named the class religious healing because I'm, I'm, I'm a, I, and I don't know, maybe Harold's the same way. This, this whole religion versus spirituality thing. I'm, I'm, I was a religion major at Duke. That wasn't in my intro. I, I came out of religious age. I think religion is a perfectly fine word. It's a fine encompassing word that can encompass all these other things. So I just decided to call it religious healing, but it was not in any way meant as a, as a distinguishing from faith or spirituality or anything. I, I think I think these words for academics have distinctive meanings. Um, for lay people, they have other meanings. And, and my approach was simply to to from from the very first session say this is some of the terminology it's used. We're going to see all of this. People use it in different ways. Um, that might make an interesting term paper to deconstruct all of that, but but for now we're just it's it's healing in relation to the, the spiritual dimension or realm. And that's as far as I take it. As far as what these words mean, um, I've written papers on the topic. I know Harold's written paper, you know, probably Barr's written stuff too. There's all kinds of academic discourse. And I think it's a I, I think it's very important and we all get very exercised about it. But but from the standpoint of this class, it's just kind of it's, it's all of the above, and, and in fact, people that do, people even that, that call themselves energy healers uh, that I'm going to be writing about and do that work, some of them refer to what they do as spiritual healing, and some of it faith healing, and some of it energy. So some people that do the very same work amongst themselves use different sort of it. I don't know. I, at some point, I kind of throw my hands up, but I try to deal with it respectfully, and I just I just defaulted to religious healing. But in my course, we, we try to cover the whole gamut from, yeah. from from liturgical institutional religion to faith healers to people that were being divorced from other shapes and all and all points in between and I and I say that without any flippancy at all I just we're, we're just trying to cover the whole spectrum of non medical not non medical healing. Well, thank you, Jeff. Terrific. Um, Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and uh, thank you all for joining. And uh, you know, everybody take care and uh, God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.